flick the agenda up on the screen there. Um, sorry about the Hangout issues. Everything looks like it's working fine with Google Hangouts. You can invite people to them. You can start them if you're the only one in there. But as soon as you try to invite people, it doesn't work. So, somewhat disappointing. Uh, the minutes you'll find linked from one of the 15 emails that I've sent you. So we're going to follow that agenda roughly. Um, and I'm going to be talking to a number of points there. However, most of the points have a link that runs off the agenda. So feel free to have a look at the agenda and follow those links up yourself so you can get a little bit more details. Now, the biggest thing happening for us at the moment is the uh, Spotlight on Technology. It's on next week. Uh, it's free registration. And there's been a lot of work and some really high quality presenters uh, coming to work with us on this. Now, if you come in to the Spotlight website, you'll see some details on the speakers uh, and the full program. Uh, and probably one of the most interesting things that I've seen today, at least, is the entries for the competitions have come back in from mainly our primary schools and, and our secondary schools. And there's some really interesting entries up there. Really good to see what they've been able to do. So it's worth having a look at that. It's definitely worth coming along to the spotlight. And it won't cost you anything. You'll get fed a couple of meals a day. Uh, you get to see all the different speakers. You do have to register. And if you go to the link there where it says register here, you've got to set up an account and then go forth and uh, register yourself. So any questions about that? With staff that are going in, do they have to attend birthdays or one day is fine? No, one day is fine. Uh, with the registration app, you can't say that you're coming on one day, but it's fine to just come for one day. You can. Is that a new feature or something we haven't found? Uh, if you do it through the app, through the mobile site, you can't. If you do it through the website, you can. Okay. All right. Good. So, um, just for interest, can we? Um, uh, Oran Park, has anyone registered for Oran Park yet? Does Joe know? Uh, yes, two of us are going. We're going on the Thursday for one day. We've registered and registered for the workshop. And so, you know, also you can register for the dinner and that's free as well? Yes, yes, but um, we, uh, we were both unable to. You're not hungry. <laughs> <laughs> and what about Eagle Vale? Yeah, um, I'll be registered, but only for the second day. Okay, good. And how about the people in the room? Yep. I'm going to vote. Do we vote? Okay. We've got only um, five teacher going. Okay, good. So is it one teacher from each of your schools? I'm actually afraid to my kids for the day. I'm going to take a different teacher each day this week. Good. And what about Bruce? I'm not. Okay, and we've had a lot of interest from other dioceses as well. We've got, I think, 11 or 12 people coming down from Wagga. We've got people coming from Parramatta Diocese, six people, uh, Newcastle, uh, I think Canberra, not sure where else. So um, there's definitely some interest there. Okay, now the next item is our one to one BYO iPad rollout planning schedule. And this is just an opportunity for us to gather some information about when you're planning to do your rollout or your boot camps and what kind of assistance you need. Now, obviously, the uh, document that's there, that's linked there, is iPad friendly. So if you do need assistance in your one-to-one -one rollout, uh, it would be great if you could go and click on the appropriate week, um, put in some information about the contact person and the level of assistance that's required. Okay. So feel free to do that. I see a few faces popping up on the document there. Now that's just going to make it easier for us, along with our secondary groupings, to organise how we can get people out to the maximum number of schools. Uh, 16 primary schools next year with one-to-one -one programs, along with the eight secondary schools that need support as well. So that's a lot of, a lot of people rolling devices out all at once. Any questions about that one? So that's just a day you want people to come to assist. It's not really the first day. 
No, it's just purely when you would like us to come out and, and give you a hand. Okay. And obviously, there might be, say, four or five of us available, but that could be split among any number of schools. Or possibly no one will be available. That's, that's definitely an option as well. Okay, a couple of new tools that have popped up, or not necessarily new, but are starting to get used. Um, and there was a bit of a discussion recently about e-portfolios and some different options, and particularly easy options. So I, I thought I'd just throw this one out there. Um, it's called Dropper. You can register with your Google account. It's free. Um, it's pretty quick and easy to set up. Um, and what it will do is let you drag and drop content in to create a digital portfolio. Um, now, I'm logged in at the moment, so it's just going into a portfolio which my, my sons put together. So they thought, well, I said, hey, do something. <laughs> do something with this. <laughs> so what I got them to do, oh, what they decided to do was take some of the surfing footage and clips and TV things and things that have happen been happening recently and put it together in a little bit of a portfolio. So if you click, if you hover over each, you'll see um, what is actually under the content there. And if I click on it, then in this case, this is a newspaper article. Now, rather than linking back to the website where the newspaper article was, um, I got them to save it as a PDF and then upload this. And the, the editing upload process is really, really straightforward. So um, it's a free tool. Uh, for example, one of the English groups are publishing the students' poetry. So they're creating a little dropper for the students' poetry. Now, to put the content in is pretty straightforward. Okay, I just click on this little edit, bu edit button. Um, and then I can drag around each one of these boxes. If I want to add something, I click on the plus. Uh, I can type in whatever text that I need. I can upload files. I can import files. So if I was to grab something off my desktop there, um, maybe that one. Okay, that photo will get uploaded. Once it's uploaded, welcome to whoever that is. Hi, Virginia. Hey, Virginia. Sorry about the hassle with Google. Yes, I'm following the email. Okay. Okay, uh, now this little switch here will enable me to make that post public or private. So students could be doing this and, and keeping their portfolios private. Um, click the tick and it's done. Then of course I can move things around, organise them how I want them. Okay, it's a tool that's incredibly easy to use, so that's probably the, the biggest advantage with it. Um, could I just get someone to turn their microphone off in the background there, thanks? <laughs> Okay, so straightforward, it's called Dropper, drop with an R, uh, dot com. Really easy to use, and I think the way that it links back to Google, um, the students could get some value out of that. The multiple people work on one thing? No, not unless they're signed in as the same person. So if you had a class Google account, for example, yeah. you could sign up using that and have them contribute. Um, you can have different areas or different droppers, yeah. um, so you can link different things together there. So that's just one I thought that some other schools are using. What's that, sorry? Oh, it's trying to work out who's in the middle. In the middle. Yeah, I'm not sure, who, not sure who that is. It's a mannequin. <laughs> <laughs> who's in the, uh, who's up close to the screen that Lachlan. looks like he's a male? Lachlan. Is that Lachlan? Not it might be his picture. <laughs> I don't think it's a video. <laughs> okay, the next thing that is definitely worth having a look at, and you should have a little play with if you haven't already, um, is have a look at getting the students to do some coding. And I've got a link here, and this link is um, just to a, a very simple studiocode.org um, tutorial which will guide the students hey everyone. through the process. One of the most exciting things about computer science. Now, learning the code sounds really nerdy. Okay. This this is completely visual. It's drag and drop coding. In no time at all, you or the students can learn how to code a Flappy Bird game. 
which is um, pretty engaging for them. Now I threw uh, my seven year old at this and he worked his way through with, without any guidance at all. They're learning about algorithms, they're learning about how to program. So in this particular case, um, when you click, what do you want to happen? Well, let's say we want it to play a wing sound. Okay, we'll click run over here. And when I click, it makes a sound, but he doesn't fly. Okay, so I probably didn't get that right. So maybe we need him to flap as well. Okay, well. So now when I click, he flaps as well as making a sound. Okay, so I've learnt stage one. And then I'm going to build on that when I move into stage two. So is that flash? Uh, no, it works on an iPad. Okay. Yeah. So next one, I've got to add a different set of blocks. And so this time I have the ability to work out, okay, sure, I can make him flap, I can make him fly, that's great. But what happens when he hits the ground? Surely it needs to be game over. So when you hit the ground, it's game over. Let's see how that works. All right, it's working except I didn't put the wing sound in, so that was a little bit boring. All right, so we'll go through and we'll go to the next one, and so forth. And the students can work their way through. Now, it is a really interesting tool. Um, it is in the new technology curriculum, Australian curriculum, which hasn't been converted into board of studies curriculum yet, but it, it is coming. So it's one of these things that kids will have to be able to, to address. So I think it's well worth a look. Um, and it, it's one of these rare things, and, and Dave and I have spoken about this before. Um, if you've played on the iPad learning about algebra, okay, playing a game where the kids are developing skills um, without really knowing about it. Okay, and it's, there's really not that many apps out there that can make fun a quality learning experience. So I, I think this is one of them. So there's an hour of code, and you've, you've seen an email about this, although, of course, you may not have read it or you may have just pushed it aside for the moment. Um, but in December, they're trying to get 15 million students or over 15 million students from around the world all to learn an hour of code within one week. Okay, and it might be a nice thing to mix up what's happening in December. So there's plenty of details there. When you register, uh, you you get a little bit of free stuff and a chance to win some good stuff, including money. So I would encourage people to have a look at that and we'll probably be pushing it a bit more if some time comes up. Has it? <laughs> Okay. Any questions about that? Pretty straightforward. Okay, eSmart Schools. What do we know about eSmart Schools? Anybody heard of them? No. Okay. Come on. Bill, are you serious? Next door. Okay. We currently have one school in the diocese that is running the eSmart Smart Schools program. It's a four year program and it's Pretty heavy going, but what it does is it makes sure that you have a, a fully comprehensive approach to cyber safety, digital citizenship right across the school. Um, now, it's good, it's quite expensive. Uh, it's about <coughs> two and a half, two eight, if you pay up front for the four years. However, the good news is that um, we have some grants via Google, $10,000, um, which we're planning to give away as partial grants. So if your school is interested in following this program through, and it is a four-year commitment, um, but by the end of those four years you become certified as an eSmart school. Um, you get all the supports that, get, that goes with it, you get teacher professional learning days. Um, so it is a, a really interesting program. John Terry are uh, in year three or four, so they're, they're coming up towards the end of their four. One of the things I love about going to John Terry when they're working on this is that um, every teacher in the school has a common language around digital citizenship. Um, and so the students get the message the same way from every teacher. So if you are interested in that, and I think it's a good opportunity. If I was in a school, I'd be pushing for it. There's 
a document I've made that I haven't linked. So uh, I'll address that in the next couple of minutes and, and the link will be up there. Or well, failing that, just email me and say that you're interested in eSmart Schools. Have a look at the website and I will forward your name into the would like a scholarship file or would potentially like the scholarship. Okay, anybody like to say anything? There seems to be a lot of me talking at the moment. There's a lot of discussion before the recording started. Did somebody in VC land just try and speak? <laughs> okay, let's fire on then. Now, one of the things that comes up periodically is we have this great technology like Google Hangouts, and they've always worked for me in the past. Unfortunately, today, um, that certainly wasn't the case. Uh, but as Dave was saying earlier, that seems to be linked to, to bigger Google issues that that we've had. What are you doing, Bill? <laughs> uh, now, we don't have a whole lot, typically, of students collaborating with other students from, from other schools. We've done a couple of projects where we did with Cairns Diocese and uh, a couple of overseas ones. Now, of course, when we go international, we have time zone issues and other challenges. Is anybody here? I did it with America for a while. Yeah. Either on via email or no, no, we did it um, VC. Either they came late or we came early, um, and the actual talking was good, but it was really hard to do any work between. It was just getting them to actually do things. Like we created a website and did things, and then just kept falling apart. So they've been missed after a while. Yeah. Anyone else have any experience? No. I know the um, the project that we did with Cairns um, and with Wagga. Because it was based around um, Mary McKillop, there's common, common work and the kids could report back on what they'd been doing. So while sometimes it was hard to collaborate, you had a common unit that was being studied. Now the biggest challenge I think with this kind of project is connecting with other schools if you don't know the people in the real world. Now Sydney Diocese have put together a little spreadsheet here. Um, which is similar to what Google have done with their international teachers, but it's just a, a spreadsheet that anybody can go in and add to, and there's teachers that are looking for different classrooms to connect with. Now, it's not quite the same as connecting with America, but the advantage is they're going to be on the same time zone, they're studying the same curriculum. So feel free to add your name to that if you would like to, or if you see people up there who are doing something that you might be interested in, well, that's a good way to make connections. And the other thing is that being Sydney Diocese, it is possibly close enough that you could make a, a physical connection at some stage as well. Okay, and on a similar on a similar angle, one of our uh, Year Seven teachers down at St Joseph's has gamified her Year Seven classroom with really interesting results. The kids are super motivated and they're creating some some really good stuff. What she wants to do is extend that out to surrounding year six classrooms or year five classrooms. So those kids have a chance to work with the year seven students from their, from their local high school. Now I said to her, why don't we just bust it open to any year five or six student from the diocese who might like to participate. So if you are interested in that, there's a link down the bottom there that says um, expression of interest here. If you click on that, you'll be able to um, have a look at a Google document and add your your name. Make sure you put your email address in so that we can contact you. Okay, let's leave Splash for a moment, Dave, and move on to our. We'll leave it to last. Leave it to last. All right. Even more of me talking then. Uh, how many people have been to ABC Splash? Okay, now I've been there a fair bit, but it's getting a lot better, a whole lot better. Um, so it came up the other day and a lot of the teachers yesterday at an in-service we were running and a lot of the teachers hadn't seen it. So I thought, well, we'll throw it out there for you guys to make sure that you are aware of it. Now, all of these resources can also be accessed through Scoodle. So if you are spending time in Scoodle, you will see them turn up there. Um, 
I think one of the biggest challenges is that sometimes we go places where there's lots and lots of resources and you get lost. Um, and Scoodle's sort of halfway between there. Here, if I come into primary and I was looking for, say, a science resource, I can click there and you'll see that there's a range of different videos that I can use in my class, topics, games, events, digital books, audio resources, etc. So there's lots of different resources there that we can use with our kids and the kids can access. Okay, and they're all free. So I think that's a useful resource. Um, is anyone using them currently with their classes? ABC Splash, yes. Yep. What sort of things are you using? I'll oh, just, um, well, different things depending on what uh, the content is. Okay, good. I think it's something that uh, a lot of teachers don't seem to be aware of, so it wouldn't be a bad thing to get out there if, uh, if that's the case. Okay, Dave? The photos for the Spotlight presentation, Christy Fielding is putting together a video um, and, and I'm, I don't know much about it other than I've got this impression that there's going to be a title about a school and then photos from that school after the title. That's the impression I'm getting. And there's still schools that haven't submitted photos. And, and I see the email is sort of threatening that your title is going to come up and then black screen. So I'm not quite sure what's really going to happen. But um, some of us here this afternoon, our schools haven't submitted photos. So I won't single out anyone, it's not necessarily you do it, <laughs> but um, could you see if, if you have got some half decent photos, which simply could mean um, that they've got to be, they're not going on the internet or anything, but on the, at the actual conference, and it might be at dinner, or I can't remember, there's just going to be a, a, a screen flow of photos of what's happening. So, they're, um, they're for the parent evening, which is on uh, the night before the conference starts, the Wednesday night. So it would be quite embarrassing if, if parents were there. Right. And it's playing in the background the whole time. So if they're waiting, they're going to be waiting to see their school. So if you had parents that were going, it would be a really good idea to have your photos there. In regards to the parents, would they invite somebody in there? Yeah, so... Um, yes. Could somebody in VC land turn their microphone off, please? Great, thank you very much. Um, so the parent night um, has a few functions, but one of them is to celebrate the entries to the, um, to the competitions. So the invites would have gone out to those people um, so that they could come along, have a look at what their students have created, um, along with learning about a few other things. So parents generally? Well, I would assume that parents generally would be... It barely yeah. mentions it on the big poster, just a little bit down the bottom of that return. Right. So whether the dryer that goes up, ice cream the dryer and everything like that, it's going to be printed off and printed on the phone. Okay. Together. If that's something that needs to be chased up, I, I can ring that up at the meeting tomorrow. I think, I think that'd be um, nice to have yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, we'll bring that up at the meeting tomorrow and... If we need that flyer to be sent out again, we can do that. Um, you guys can distribute that as you see fit. Does anyone want to know the schools that haven't sent any in? <coughs> Doesn't matter. Um, but anyway, Joe, you've got a, an iPhone. Go and take some photos of kids in the classrooms and just send them an email. <laughs> <window. laughs> I, I just uploaded them just not long ago today, Dave. <laughs> I'll just reply to that text message of Scott that she'd done. <laughs> okay, JD, do you want to talk, seeing as David's reluctant? Um, Overdrive, um, quite a few updates over the last few weeks. Most important one, there is no more Adobe ID necessary. For kids who are under 13, it is unbelievably easy now. They pretty much download the app, launch it, tap a button that says, yes, I'm under 13, that's it. It authenticates in the background and then add your library and away you go. Now, I've um, put together a, another website, just, you know, oh yeah, here it is. Um, just scroll down. That easy read, that is now available 
um, through your school's Oliver. That simply means everybody now, if you log into Oliver, you will see the content of Overdrive, if it's an ebook or an audio book. You tap on it and it just uh, appears in your browser and away you go. Too easy. Um, now just scroll down a bit. No, oh, oh, got me. <laughs> tap on getting started. I've tried to keep this just really simple and clean. The first little video tutorial there, that's for students under 13. It literally goes for one minute, 30 seconds. So, and that's how long it takes to log in. If you're over 13 or staff, I'm assuming you're over 13, uh, you just sign in with your first name, surname, put your email address in and a password, and that's it. You are also authenticated and off you go. And the next one, that one goes for a little bit longer, about six minutes, I think. But that just takes you through how to borrow and return. And I'll put some more up as time goes by. But any school that's got one-to-one -one iPad classes, I'm totally happy to pop along and get your kids up and running and yeah, walk them through how to, how to search, all that sort of thing. Uh, oh, the staff info. Um, I haven't quite finished that page, but it's just useful information. There's a direct link to the app. Um, that's uh, that's a link to the digital library just on your um, in browser, and um, how you do it through uh, the system. So more will come up on that later. Let's see. Um, what else did I? What was I going to say? Oh, um, with iOS 8, if you've got kids with um, physical disabilities, low vision, uh, the inbuilt support is absolutely amazing. Just contact me for more. Another uh, third party keyboard came out this morning for children with low vision or physical disabilities. It's just amazing. So just contact me on that. Uh, the other, my other website has all that information on it. But just contact me and I'll have it come out or talk to you about it. Um, I think that's it. Okay. Oh. How well can everyone hear from the um, schools out there as well? He, he, it sounds okay, Virginia? Yep, okay. <laughs> um, we're going to just have a touch upon um, the reason. <laughs> That's okay. Sorry. Keep going. Did you want to talk? No, no, no. That okay. was the um, message. Okay. Came over the loudspeaker. Okay, so um, a few weeks ago, Apple released an updated operating system called you said it, you, I can never say the word, so everyone can pronounce it Yosemite. But everyone just says Yosemite because it's so much easier to say. No, it's like Vegemite. Yeah, but it's actually it's it's the Yogi Bear National Park. Yeah. Is what. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
but schools won't be actually even updating it from, from our perspective, but rather doing a new image at a certain time. So that'll be based on 10.10.1 or 10.10.2 when they come out. So some of the really neat features, some of the really good stuff actually is designed for real people, not for shared schooled computers. So the real features are actually designed for people who are in the triangle. People who have an iPhone, an iPad and a Mac. So the ones in the triangle get much more features than, say, a computer in your classroom, which everybody shares. And that's because everything's based on Apple ID. And, and on Mark's computer here now, you can see, um, if you, it might be, I'm not sure how visible it will be, but the tabs across the top are different and they change size depending on how focused they are to the middle. And the more you have, the smaller the edge. See it over on the, oh, you might not be able to see that. Over on the right hand side, they get a little bit smaller. Um, so there's a lot of visual changes but there's a lot of functional stuff as well. But a lot of the functional stuff requires you to have other stuff. So let's have a look what I mean. If I click this icon at the top here, and what it's done is showed me all the tabs. Now, I, I don't know if Mark's going to have stuff on, but here we go here. This could be risky. Mark also, um, on his other laptop, has this Google page open. And on his iPad, he's got an old 4. I feel sorry for Mark, it's an iPad 4, it's old. And on Daniel's iPad, he's using the same Apple ID as Mark is, so we can see what Daniel's looking at at the moment. But another thing you can do now is, well, we can actually close, we can go to these links, or we can actually close them as well. So you can see how the close icon comes up. So we can control that other iPad, which we're not even using. Well, Mark's using it now, I could go and close what he's looking at. Um, so, the, in other words, sometimes you're doing some research and you might want to continue that research from another device. So the devices that always know what's going on. Now, that's been available for, for a couple of years as well, but they've just changed the whole way that positions itself. Um, there's a lot of other privacy issues now. You can change the browser. Sorry, the, um, you can change the um, uh, search engine away from Google but that's not something that's what, freely pushed in our diocese since we are so Google. But Google are a tracking company and they live for tracking. So if you don't like to be tracked, you can use DuckDuckGo, which doesn't do any tracking whatsoever. So that means if you, if you notice that your searches are returning ads on the side, that won't happen if you use DuckDuckGo. Not that big a deal for most people. Um, um, there's a lot of other things like when you're just doing a Google search or whatever, if I wanted to search for, um, I don't know, spiders, it searches Google and in this case it's not showing much else. Um, it's not giving many other options but it, this will actually search lots of other options as well. We're not seeing that happen here. With Spotlight on the other hand, Spotlight is entirely different. I did the command spacebar and spotlight now searches the web it searches wikipedia it searches your computer so if i search spiders here that might not be a very it, it's given me spider man a wikipedia reference it's given me pdf documents on the computer definition of spider full articles to and and furthermore here other documents bing searches it's giving lots of different um information about what I've just typed at the top here. So I'm in Spotlight, which is this Spotlight at the top, um, but it's now moved to the middle of the screen. Another example of Spotlight, if I type in dollar sign and one, it tells me that a, a US dollar is a dollar fourteen Australian and a few other things there. But if I type in a dollar one, I now know the Australian dollar is 88 cents and 70 euros, etc. Um, 70 cent you or whatever they are 0.7 euros so so there's a lot of um smarts built in so the whole idea of of um of searching is changed you don't need to go to other devices it's a calculator as well so some schools were doing this sorts of thing i don't know if it's going to get the right answer 
What answer? Oh, no results. Oh, because I've got a one of them. I should have that. Well, this will be interesting. I haven't ever tested this before. Did it get the answer right or not? Oh, you got it right. Yeah. So it's it understands order of operations and stuff like that as well. But there's lots of other um, m mathematics that you can do as well. Or you can hit return and it launches the uh, calculator. Pretty pretty run of the mill stuff that's been happening for some time as well. That has it's just nicened up the interface. If we um, if we look at just general screens, a lot of this looks really, really yucky, I think, or babyish. It's meant to look like iOS 7 and now iOS 8. These icons look a bit toyish, um, and a lot of the fine icons don't look so good. But when iOS 7 came out, I thought it looked yuck, and now I think it looks really good. So, And Jeanette's disagreeing with me, so maybe it's a personal taste thing. Um, th that always personal taste, and it might grow. Um, if I bring back the dock, um, how do you, is the dock here? Not here anymore. Um, the dock, I think, is really nice, but your system preferences, I don't like these icons at the top here so much, but they, they, um, they all work. Where's dock? Is dock here somewhere? Yeah. Here, dock. Um, size, magnification, position on screen. Animate automatically hide. Okay, so if I bring back the dock, you might see that it's entirely different look. Um, and I do like that. I think that looks quite nice. Um, some a change to the dock that they've done is now if what doesn't Mark need on his dock, he doesn't need PowerPoint because nobody uses PowerPoint. So if I drag PowerPoint off, you, can, you, you guys probably can't see that now. But instead of the puff of smoke, it's now got the word remove there. So they've just changed. I'll press escape and that will go back. Um, so they've changed stuff like, like that. Something I won't do, but if you plug in, if you plug in an iPad, and I think it might have to be an iPad 4 or later. I don't think this works for an iPad 2. If you plug in an iPad, I'll, I'll semi-do this for you without an iPad, and you go in quick time and go file, new movie recording. This is really neat. So what does that mean? Can you do two at once? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm not going to. So, so if I do this under this icon here, this is saying what cameras I can use. But if I've plugged in an iPad, the iPad will appear here as the camera and the audio option. But if you want to show someone how to do stuff on an iPad, you can record the iPad straight from QuickTime and by just choosing it as the camera but not choosing it as the audio, if that makes sense. So you can talk and do the iPad stuff all at the same time. Um, were you screen recording this with time? Yes. Oh, OK. <laughs> uh, I think it's still going. So I've just brought, oh, OK. What did you do before you just close buzzed him off? I think you can close that one. I can close that one, you reckon? Okay. Um, the other, because oh, I've done a new screen recording. The other thing is the green button now is now full screen mode, and we're still recording. Yeah. The green button now. I wonder if it recorded the recording. It probably did. Yeah. So the, the green button now in all of these windows is actually full screen mode, such that everything disappears off the screen. And if you if you don't like that, if you like the old way, you just hold the option key down as you do with most things, and that'll give you the old reference the old way of doing stuff. Um, there's actually new stuff everywhere. There's actually really, really great new stuff everywhere. So for example, if I want to launch um, um, Preview and bring up the Preview program, Preview's done something, oh, I need an actual document in it, don't I? So what that'll do, that, is it a Preview document? Okay, so previews markup has actually changed. So if I click this to show the markup toolbar and say this is a document I want to sign, this has changed so you've got more markup tools, which are really, really, some of them are really good. Um, and also on top of that, I can now do my signature for a markup which 
could be from an email or whatever. I can do this signature straight on the trackpad. So I can use the camera to take a photo of my signature, but this that's been around for about four years. But now you can actually use the trackpad to sign your signature. So if Mark wants to sign his signature on stuff, he can just go click here, and he can go M W, and there he goes. Signature's done. Oops. So what do I do now? Press <laughs> A. Press any key when finished. I've already got mine on mine. So there's Mark's signature. So that looks good. And now that can be actually just dragged and sign, just click on it and drag and put that on any document, resize it or whatever, and position it where you want, and there's the document signed. So you can have as many signatures as you like. Um, this, this sort of stuff is readily, can I use your mail? Everyone wants to read all Mark, Mark's messages. Um, all I need is any message with an attachment. So I just go to view, messages, attachments there. Um, doesn't matter. Can I do it to that? No, can't do it to that. Um, the smarts has improved. Do, do you know something which has got um, um, okay? Yeah, yeah. So, oh, but now I want to. PDF or, or, or a photo or a photo or a PDF or anything like that um, or or better still let me just do new and to this new message will this work um, to this new message we'll go and grab an attachment and that'll do Oh, no, that's no good because it's model. Okay, so if I click on this, I can mark it up in the email message, but that's actually not a... Okay, so here we can do exactly the same thing right in the email from people or to people, and you can come in and do stuff to, to this in any way you'd like. So you can have attachments right in your mail, mark up things, add text, do whatever you like to change that attachment, um, and then when you click Done those changes are in that attachment. So let's say someone sends you something you've got to sign, simple, get it out of the email, sign it, send it back, and you don't even need to leave your email. So stuff like that is, is just handy, but that's not going to help school computers. This is all about personal. Other personal type things they've included is if I'm on my phone writing an email message, as I get near my computer, I can put the phone down and that email message can be waiting on the computer ready to continue typing. Same goes for the iPad, so all three work together. So that's one of the handoff things that happens. Um, so sometimes you're doing it on a little phone, there are gestures against the dock which shows you what you're doing on an iPad and what you're doing on the phone and lets you click on them to continue working on those things on the, um, on the computer. So again, see what I'm saying about, this is all about the triangle, about, say, people owning multiple devices get more new features. Um, AirDrop, now, I can. you don't need to be on any network with iOS, so iPad, iPhone, and Mac, don't need to be on the same networks. If I go to AirDrop in the Finder, it will now find iPhones and iPads that are running iOS 8. So what do we got here? They're probably computers, um, but Jeanette's there twice, so how could she be there twice? So I'm seeing Jeanette's iPhone and Jeanette's MacBook, and I'm on Mark's computer, and I'm seeing Mark's iPad. So if Mark wants to send stuff quickly to his, um, his iPad from his computer, he could bring up what he wants to send and drag and drop it and, and give it to his computer. And the way this all now works is, I don't know if that was very big or whatever the case was, you need to see what Mark's saying. Mm -hmm. It's saying, what does he want to open that PDF with? And he's got about a list of 10 different things that he can open the PDF with on his iPad. Um, so, so see the big triangle is getting bigger and bigger. Um, for That's a two-way... Send so now you can send anything from iPhone, iPad, 
to computer. And the reason why these things, Apple don't do them initially and straight away, is all to do with other technologies they put in place first. And that, for example, is this iCloud Drive. Google Drive, Dropbox, and now iCloud Drive are all very, very similar. So this is an iCloud Drive file, just like a Google Drive app on a Mac, and just like Dropbox on a Mac, you can now see what's in your iCloud. So when you go to uh, an iPhone or an iPad and save stuff in iCloud, this is seeing it immediately in Keynote. So these presentations Mark could be working on right now on his iPad and they would be changing right here on the computer. But that's always been the case, but now we can physically see them in the Finder. Apple always hid them from people in the Finder because they never trusted people. I don't know. I don't know why they did it. So that has all been encompassed into this um, this AirDrop works. Because AirDrop now is basically saying, what folder do you want me to put these in? Because all these devices took. So now you can have, you can see text edit, you can see preview, and heaps and heaps of applications all support this now already with their updates. Um, text messaging is the same now on iOS as it is in on the Macs. Sorry, I've launched FaceTime. I want text messaging. I won't do FaceTime. Um, with text messaging, this is really, really neat. Uh, this one? Yeah. So, so both on, on iOS 8 and macOS, when you click Details, you find information. This is multi-people in a message, just like iOS, but it also keeps a list of every single photo that this message thread has ever sent in its, in its life. So if you've got people who send photos and you don't delete them, you can go back and find them through the thread. Now, what we're also seeing up here in the top right, so just see where I've gone. So let me just say, um, um, I, I'll use this one as an example because I know who this is. If I, if I go details, no, I'm on do not disturb. Okay, so um, if I go details, these three icons have always, two of those have always been there. Call this person, FaceTime this person. Here's a new one which hasn't been around, and it's back. And this is control, let's click it. This is say invite to share my screen or ask to share screen. So Mark could say, can I share your screen? Or he could say, hey, you share my screen. And that's physical screen sharing, so that means we both work on the same screens at the same, same time. So if you are... Um, I'm messaging someone on a Mac and they're saying, I oh, just type here, just do that. Well, you can say, well, do it for me just by bringing, going to details and going to the screen sharing and ask or do that invite and, and then actually both working on the same screen. So again, this isn't going to happen in the classroom because the classroom computers are not personal, they don't have Apple IDs, and this is all about Apple IDs. Um, any comments, questions so far? Because again, in terms of personal land, let's see how we're going here. Now Mark's not too far away and you have to be within distance. Let's say I, I want to look at my Wi-Fi. If I click on the Wi-Fi symbol, what are we seeing? We're, okay. um, we're not seeing what I was expecting to see. But if Mark, if you look at your iPhone, would you? Ah, it's interesting. What what you would normally see, and maybe these iPhones out of range, um, is automatic hotspot. So as soon as you look at your Wi-Fi now, if you've got an iPhone that does hotspot that with hotspot off, or an iPad that does hotspot with hotspot off, it will automatically turn hotspot on on those devices and link you to those from that list automatically without touching those devices. And it won't it physically turns them on for your computer only and turns them off when they're finished. So you're not doing any battery excess. So normally they just uh, um, would appear there. Are you run an 8.1? Yeah, interesting. So yeah, um, don't, don't, cause it's okay, no big deal. Um, is that 
important for, for, for people who use hotspot it's quite important because they don't have to do anything it just actually um, it just works you can now rename multiple stuff on the finder you can select as many options as you like and when you right click them and if you choose rename you can actually rename them to to you can set replace text fine replace with you can set all different rules up you can add text to them after the names and or you can set up a format and you can put numbers after them so you can rename multiple things you know sometimes you get a batch of photos and they're all called DC1692 and you might want to call them you know excursion 1 for example where you could go and do that sort of thing um, there so the finder it, so there's actually like different things uh, basically everywhere if you turn on options with your phone and iPad now if someone rings your phone, you can answer it on the Mac, you can answer it on the iPad, you can answer it on whatever device you're on. You can send genuine text messages from all three, not just iMessages. You can actually send genuine text messages as well to people on any device whatsoever. Um, the dictation is better again. So by dictation, I'll just check this here. If we go into Word as an example, if I do function, function is dictation on, it's not turned, oh yes, it's on. Dictation is supposed to be a lot better. There you go. Patient is supposed to be a lot better. Sometimes I, I big patience, oh, it's still recording everything else. Yeah. Um, so what, it, what I could have demoed, oh no, it's the voices. You, you need to go in to the dictation settings and get the all new voices. Um, and, the, and in your dictation settings and the system preferences, you can do some updates there, which update the old voices and stuff that was there. But um, at the all the commands are, are now in accessibility under dictation. So if you're not sure what commands to use, but if you're seriously going to use dictation, they're just there now. Whereas you have to go out and do to find out what the actual yeah. commands to tell it to do they're stuff. Just there at your um, so a couple couple more things. There's all this notification stuff which has changed and you've got an edit button down here and there's all these apps that can appear in this. So they're changing. Just like this is... A, what's here is 100% the same as iOS 8. So people have changed to that. You can now customise this stuff here. You can put a calculator into your notifications. You know, you can put different things into your notifications. So what they're doing is making things very, very similar and very, very much at working together. Um, I'll, I'll probably leave leave it at that. If you get a brand new computer and you set it up from scratch, it actually won't ask you for an account anymore. You can just use your Apple ID as your total login. So you don't have to come up with a new name and a new password. You can just use your Apple ID as your login for a total new, um, for a new computer. Um, and if you change your Apple ID password, it changes on your computer, and all that sort of stuff keeps in sync. So the whole idea of having, you know, different password for your computer and here and there, that's all being uh, reduced out as well. You can look up on the internet, all this sort of stuff. So, um, but... Realistically, what people use, what people get out of it, is going to be all dependent upon what devices you've got. Um, do not disturb, you'll notice, is involved here. What Apple have done, which is quite good, is they're realising when people are presenting. So if you're projecting the screens, they're taking away noises. So as Jeanette says before, if, I, if you do the change the volume, you can't hear the quack, quack, quack anymore. That's because it knows I'm presenting. So you know how if you, you, some people might be presenting to people at a conference or whatever, and they change the volume and it goes quack, quack, quack. Well, that doesn't do it anymore. That same sort of thing. If you're presenting and someone sends you a text message, it knows you're presenting. So the text message won't come up on the screen. So it's, it's, it's aware of the things that you're doing. So if you're using text messaging on your computer, then you, they don't come up and in the middle of a presentation that you might be doing. That could be even to the kids in class. 
I remember teachers saying, I don't want them because it comes up on the, the kids in the classroom seal. Well, that won't happen anymore. Does anyone have any questions or any comments or anything at all from, from anywhere? I think things are very, very exciting in computer land. Mr. Woolley? Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Seems like there's not a whole lot of conversation happening today, which I think is something we definitely need to address going forward. Yeah, you could um, go through every single application on the computer and see um, changes in it. But the other thing is stuff don't work as well. One of the reasons why we're not kicking this off in schools is, what's that horrible software that people use? Notebook. Notebook. That's right, Bill, you've got it in one. Smart notebook don't work. So you go to launch it and it tells you it's not compatible. So you can run the demo from the 2014 demo version. But um, smarter dying in the diocese, I think, anyway. So it might be time that it didn't work. Can I just add one? I know there's a few people here watching who have uh, students with low vision. One of the things that's really hard, when the student has their screen zoomed in, it's really hard to help them because you lose track of where you are on the screen. That we Yosemite, you've got picture-in-picture um, -picture zoom. So you can resize uh, a shape. It can be a square. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, oh, you've got to turn it on yeah, yeah, in accessibility. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, it's got the little and box display. display. The colour just goes into central um, colour. Open display. Oh, it's here. Sorry, it's not there. It's here. Yeah, that's it there. The zoom stop picture and picture. Oh, yeah, yeah. So now, like you that. can, yeah. Just and you can make that any size you like. And I find that awesome when you're sitting next to a student because you can see the rest of the screen. You know where you are. So that's a really nice feature. And that's on iOS 8 as well. That would be excellent for um, screencasting. Yeah, oh, it can be used for any, any number of things. It's also one of the tools in markup, in preview. So in preview, there's a tool, one of the tools that you've got now is to circle something and what you circle magnifies. Does that make sense? So when you're doing um, notation of documentation, you can say click here, you can use that tool to draw a circle around it and it magnifies that as well. So that's just the standard um, control key and two fingers up. Two, two fingers drowned. But if you don't like that, you just use the full screen, yeah. like we've had for many. You see what I mean? When it's in full screen and you're trying to support a student, it's really hard. You lose track of where you are. Which one do you want it left on? Uh, yeah, go the new one. <laughs> go the new one. Give it a try. Okay, now we have our two central rooms in the corner quietly. So, would you like to say anything? Or? Central update. Mm -hmm. so, central update. Um, Speak loudly, you just like to So, there isn't very much to say that hasn't been said via email. Um, just thank you to the people that have actually been reading their emails and keeping up to date and reading all of the information sent through. We have tried really carefully to capture as much of the communication as we can in that written form so people can go back to it. Um, we're dealing with any of the queries that have come through. I think there's a couple of little issues still outstanding with um, sharing stems um, because of the change in the functionality with the comment banks that we've got our areas for growth and learning gains in the shared comment tab then people are having trouble sharing a STEM with their staff. So we're in the process of troubleshooting that with the guys in Central at the moment. And one of the things we might be doing is loading in actually a little bank of the STEMs that are suggested. Um, we're still just waiting to hear back from them though, aren't we? Yep. Hopefully a couple of days. Hopefully a couple of days. Um, and Continuum Track is up and running. So um, your kindergarten and year one teachers in particular are probably really keen to get in and have a go at that for their end of year data collection. Um, a big email went out about that on Monday, I think, to principals and APs. So um, I'd really be encouraging people K through six to get in there and start using the tracker. 
There isn't a mandate around that at the moment, but don't be surprised if it comes within the next 12 months. Not for everyone, but certainly for the lower grades. And we're in the process at the moment of refining all the bits and pieces ready so that best start data will go straight into Central at the beginning of next year. So that's always been on the cards and nearly ready to go at the moment. Um, in Continuum Tracker, you've got access to your literacy continuum, which has been unchanged since the module opened up back in about May. But we've now got the numeracy continuum in there as well. So it was always there, but the problem we had was aspect one was all squashed together into one sort of um, aspect, I suppose, and now it's split into its four component parts. So you can report on each of those four components of aspect one individually. So that's something customised that we had Central do for us. Um, there's also a really basic little reading levels continuum in there as well, just to support classroom teachers in providing that data in a centralised way too. So um, lots of things in there for you to go in and have a look and play with. Have a play with the reports and the analysis graphs as well. Um, the analysis graphs in particular will be more exciting next year, but go in and have a look and see what they are. And just remember that, especially in Continuum Tracker, you can't break anything. Just go through and click and find all the different links. It's really flexible in terms of how you can go from an aspect to a student to a cohort view um, and back again. So I would just really encourage people to go in and have a play and not to be afraid and just remember you've got your big green save button and your big red cancel button. There's nothing that you can do to break or wreck data in there. And um, just in case it does come up again, just remember with your comment wizard that there, it is actually impossible to wipe and lose comments in there. They're saved one at a time. Um, we can access user logs if need be, but yeah, there isn't any way that teachers can say I spent hours and hours typing comments and then it all disappeared. It's actually completely impossible. So hopefully we won't run into that problem again. Any questions? No? Great. Excellent. That's it. Thank you. Anything else from those out there in VC land? No, all good, thanks. Virginia? <clears throat> Lock, lock one. Yeah. Oh, good. Thumbs up, lock one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, assume he's all good. <laughs> Tamara? Any questions? No, good Okay, no problems. Well, um, the recording from today looks like it's still working, so that's a good thing. Uh, we'll get that out to you so you can go through it all again, and we'll get it out to the people who weren't able to be here. My apologies for the um, for the hangout issue. Um, Cam is quite a surprise that it hasn't worked because uh, it has worked previously. So uh, apologies for that and enjoy the rest of the term. Don't forget the links to any of those documents. If you want to take part in any of those opportunities, put your name down and we'll be in contact. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye.